This is news today. Thanks for your company. Now, former president of Ghana Real Estate Developers Association, Dr. Alexander Chenebua, has been arraigned before an Accra magistrate court. Dr. Chenebua was arrested with nine others for engaging in Simbox fraud. The other suspects are Ebenezer Boating, Victor Wusu, Kujua Sari, Emmanuel Kofi Esilfi, Edmond Esilfi, Kweku Apia, and uh, two others. The same box process, including two foreign nationals, were arrested by a joint anti telecommunication fraud tax force in collaboration with the Criminal Investigation Department of the Ghana Police Service. Dr. Trenibor's plea for bill was not taken by the court presided over by Wolanyu Kotoku. get an insight into this case from Superintendent Francis Barr, he is Director in Charge of Legal and Prosecution of the Criminal Investigation Department of the Ghana Police Service. You're welcome to the program, Superintendent. Thank you. Superintendent, uh, give us detail of this case. What exactly has Dr. Alex Chonebo been charged with? Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, you know, the we have a law in place, uh, Electronic Communications Act, that is uh, Act 775 of 2008. Under that law, there are provisions regulating offenses committed by the use uh, by, 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 by uh, telecommunication, uh, illegal telecommunication operators. So in this case, Dr. Chinewa and the other uh, offenders are being held or being prosecuted for conspiracy first. Conspiracy because uh, when two or more persons conspire together or act together, they could be charged for conspiracy. So they, they, be, they are being charged for conspiracy to commit crime. That is providing electronic communication service without license under Section 23 of that law. And then two, providing electronic communication services without license when license is required, that is section 73 of that law. And then the last one, possessing illegal devices, that is contrary to section 135 of Act 775. So these are the offenses, uh, the, the, the offenses that are, have been brought against Dr. Chinebua and the other uh, uh, accused person. Mm. I see. What, what are we expecting the matter to go back to court? Uh, you know, these are offenses that are to be prosecuted at the High Court. So in the meantime, we are taking these cases to, to the, uh, secret, the, the Magistrate Court for them to be remanded in proper custody. While the dockers, we have already sent some of the dockers to the Attorney General's office. So the dockers will be assigned to sit at it. When they are ready, they will call us and then the, the case will be transferred to the High Court. So in the meantime, we are going to the, to the magistrate court, waiting to put our, our, our things together, and then finally go to the high court. Mm, I see. And we, we, we still don't know when we'll go to the high court? Oh, I cannot give you a specific time that tomorrow or tomorrow next. But, you know, the state attorney needs to also uh, study the, the docket, understand the case, and then look at the evidence before he goes to the, to, to the very, court. Very well. Now, in, in the investigations, what have we realized so far with this case? Oh, what we have realized so far, I think we, we have enough evidence to, to, to hold them for whatever offenses that have been brought against them. We, 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 we the tax force did a good, we did a good job. Well, we make them, we were, they were in the act. They were, they were, they were working. All the machines were activated and they were, they were operating. So we have enough evidence to prosecute them. I see we'll leave it here for now. Thank you very much, Superintendent. Superintendent Francis Bais, Director in Charge of Legal and Prosecution with the CID of the Ghana Police Service. Now, away from that, the Trade Union Congress has reiterated a stance against plans to privatize the Electricity Company of Ghana. The privatization arrangement is one of the conditions under which the U.S. government is extending some $500 million to help address Ghana's energy crisis. The TUC, however, says privatization is not the answer 
and that government should rather inject some efficiency into ECG's operations and ensure the institution gets all the inputs it requires to work. TUC says although it appreciates government's efforts to address the challenge, it is not satisfied with the slow pace. It however insists privatization is not the answer. And, uh, we need to ensure that what is needed to be provided, uh, ECG is provided, what the kind of input that they needed, and also some uh, injecting efficiency in the system generally is what we are all looking for. Government has out outlined some areas which uh, as a result of our uh, the funding requirements they will have to go. But we all have to be very careful that we, 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 I mean, we deal with it effectively. We are not convinced that the answer really lies directly in the area of privatization of any of the energy companies. The TEC General Secretary is however not saying how far they will go to stop any moves to privatize ECG, explaining they are yet to get firm word from government on the issue. Uh, we are yet as Labour to be clearly made to appreciate what government's intentions are. There are some indications which have not been tabled appropriately. Uh, we thought that the way, they, they said it's not privatization, it's uh, injecting of uh, private participation in the ECG. Uh, if we get to know the real situation, we'll react. But for us, we think that this energy system has to be looked at properly and do not think that it is purely the, uh, just privatizing the ECG will be the answer. I have not think that the Bolivian government will go that way. The Ghana Employers Association is meanwhile also equally dissatisfied with the numerous unfulfilled promises to fix the crisis. We, we are not satisfied until um, we have the full complement of power that is needed for production. So we will continue to engage, we will continue to draw the attention of government on the need to really quicken the process. It's very, very, otherwise uh, businesses are going to have suffer and suffer big time. We appreciate the enormity of the task. Um, the energy needs of the country is increasing. And uh, maybe this thing should have been done uh, some five years ago. But here we are. We, need, we, we understand that there are challenges. But we need to really look at how we can think outside the box and ensure that we respond positively so that the availability of energy uh, will, not, will, will be um, resolved uh, in the shortest possible time. Abigail Adamakunchi for Joy News. We'll stay on the subject of power distribution in Ghana. Well, the Electricity Company of Ghana is now out with a new load shedding timetable. This was after the company was directed by the power minister, Dr. Kobna Donko, to come out with a new timetable and adhere to it. So let's find out details of this new timetable. Uh, Eric Ketis Howard was there for us and he's joined me here in the studio with somebody. What are the details of this new timetable? Okay, what it means is that essentially what the director of operations of the ECG is saying is the fact that um, if you go off beyond 24 hours, mm -hmm. right, um, it's, it's either a fault mm -hmm. and you must report it. So the new timetable is, is structured in such a way that you, might, you get power for 12 hours and you would go off for 24 hours. That is the standard. That's, but as he says that worst case scenario, that's the worst case scenario. That means you have to go up for 24 hours and you have life for 12 hours. But he said when a situation improves, mm -hmm. it means that when you are supposed to have, have life for 12 hours, you may not have life for 12 hours, it could extend. So for now, what he, he particularly said mm -hmm. was that we should hope that the situation will improve. But it also means mm -hmm. that when the situation worsens, the new load shedding timetable that is supposed to end at, the, at March would, would be useless, would be rendered actually mm. useless. They would just straight away and they will go by what is really happening. Over, over what period are we expected okay. to use the time? It's going to start from 7th of February. So mm. tomorrow we should expect the low shedding timetable to be in the Daily Graphic mm. and other newspapers. And it's going to end on 30th March. That is for the three months period because the ECG is, according to officials, they are hoping that by that time period, right, by that time period they would. Um, have solved the power crisis, although they have improved the situation. So they are hoping from now to 30th March, something will be done about the situation so that we could enjoy more power. But until then, um, that's how it's going to be. And there's another interesting mm. twist that came up, the industries, mm -hmm. right? Now, what, what happens with the industries is that they are going to have lights for 24 hours. And, and they are, no, sorry, they are going to have light for 48 hours, mm -hmm. and they'll go off for 24 hours. So it's more of the reverse 
mm. of what we are experiencing. What, what we are but for experience. industries within residential, residential areas, area. mm. for them, for that one, they easy to say they can they can't help the situation. They will have to go with the residential timetable. But for those industries within the industrial area, they it, it, within the industrial yeah. uh, enclave. Yeah. Now, let's talk about the domestic timetable, mm. which which is what we we have seen. Uh, there's there's a bit of confusion in it because uh, some communities are on standby to be put off at any time. Yes, uh, explain that bit. Well, okay, what the director of operation was saying that when you're on standby, it's it's not like it, it's it will always be in a worst case scenario. It could be for good, it could be for bad. I don't want to do PR, but that's what he was saying, that it could be for good, it could be for bad. So it means that if you're on standby, and let's the standby to go off, and the power situation improves, you won't go off, you enjoy power, mm -hmm. and you keep doing it. But if you're on standby to go off, and the power situation worsens, you could go off, and you, it, it would be 24 hours, mm -hmm. or depending on the situation, and, or even more. So it's, it's, you're in between. But those communities that are supposed to go off will go off all right. Mm -hmm. If you're on standby, it means that Probably, let's say for today, your lights are supposed to go off, but because the situation has improved, you still have lights. You still right? have lights. Or your lights are supposed to um, come at a certain point. Mm. So you already don't have lights. You're supposed to get it at a certain point mm. in time. But because the situation has worsened, you wouldn't get it for the okay, so, hours. So, so let, let's, let's try and break mm. it down. If I have lights today from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., yes. I'm expected to go from 6 p.m. today till 6 p.m. Friday. Yes. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, so that's, that's the, the new, that, that's how the, the shape of the new timetable now. So but, but that's what we already experienced. That's what we already And even worse. And even worse. So, so what, is the, what is the assurance they are sticking to this timetable? Okay, yeah, we asked them that question. And they said that for now, they are going by the, um, the load that Gridco is giving to them. So, and they said all things being equal, if Gridco comes out and say that, okay, this is the amount of load we are giving from now to March, this timetable would properly be strictly adhered to. Mm. But where the situation, Great Crow comes and say, hey, um, per what is happening, we will need to shed off more power, shed mm. off more load and everything. In, in, in other that, words, it's just a guide. It's just a guide. They may or may not adhere uh, to it. Depending to on it. the situation. If the power situation improves... It seems very uncertain. Yeah, it seems the, very the uncertain. The situation we are in now. I also asked the, um, the, the director of operations what, how their communications with Gridco mm. Because we always get this... Um, there is this back and forth between mm. ECG and Gridco where they find... You hear ECG say, it's not from them, mm. it's Gridco. And Greek people too say it's not from them, it's from ECG. Moving the goal. Yeah, but they, they tell you that they, they are in constant communication. But what he said was that Greek people is, um, you know, they, we, they, when they put up the power, it goes to a, a larger area. Mm -hmm. So depending on the situation, sometimes Greek people puts up the power before mm -hmm. communicating to them. I see. Mm -hmm. But how about essential services? How do, do they come in here? Yeah, why he said we, he made mention of the fact that the essentials are like the hospitals mm -hmm. and some the security institutions and everything. Mm -hmm. He said, per this particular load shedding, they will still enjoy constant power supply, mm -hmm. depending on the situation. So if the situation is as it is now, they will have their power. But depending if the situation gets worse, then it means that you know, um, at some instances they will be off and they will have to manage with the situation until. So what essentially what he was saying was that we should hope for constant power supply or this for the situation to improve. Thank you very much for the information. Eric Curtis Howard has been explaining to us the new timetable or load shedding uh, timetable. Uh, and uh, well, I hope you understood. If you have any comments, you can leave it on our social media platforms, join news on TV. But now we can talk about the interior. Uh, minister, who, Mark Woyungo, who says moves will be accelerated to redistribute prisoners from the Kumasi Central Prisons to the Anka Four Prisons. This comes after an attempted jailbreak flew in a fire scare at the facility. Prison officers carry weapons. At the moment, they have very limited, very few weapons. We need to arm them. And we also need to work closely with the police and securing our prison. The prison service is already working, collaborating with the, uh, the police service. If you go to Amkafo, which is a maximum security prison, you see officers, police officers there, just to support the prison officers. So it is ongoing. It's just that we need to intensify, we need to spread it out to cover most of, if not all, our prisons.
I've gone to quite a number of prisons, and uh, I myself personally am not happy with uh, what I see in some of these prisons. Some of them, the walls are falling, and uh, most of them, too, I mean, they, the conditions are deplorable. We need to uh, uh, have a second look at our prisons. I, in my view, uh, the prisons have been neglected for some time, and that is why I'm now beginning to focus on the prison. Recently, we got some assistance from the British government, and uh, there's some work which is ongoing at the Sawam, uh, Sawam prison. What, what kind Ankabu, of work? Well, they are giving it a facelift. They mm. are putting up some structures at the infirmary. They are improving it, and they are doing some extension work to some of the structures. That, that was last year? That was last year, yes. So it's still ongoing. Mm. Yes, what we are going to do is we're going to relocate some of the prisoners. Obviously, some of the structures have been burned down. Uh, the, some of the prisoners will have to be relocated. And uh, we've made provisions. Some vehicles have been sent there. And police are also on standby to escort them to uh, Ankaful. Ankaful is a new prison. It mm. has got a lot of uh, room. So uh, it's likely most of them uh, will be transferred to Ankaful prison. I also spoke with Chief Public Relations Officer of the Ghana Prison Service, DSP Vitalis Aie. Uh, attempted jailbreak. Attempted jailbreak. Yes, who did not succeed. Mm. And from what we gather, as your reporter said, there was a fire outbreak last mm. night in one of the prison cells. And the officers on duty tried to evacuate the pri prison inmates there to safety. And when they brought them out, they refused to go back and decided to open their colleague prisoners to come out and join them and if possible break jail and where we got it was in the night. Mm. That is what we see for now. But even how the fire started, we are yet to get the report from the fire service and know whether it was started by the rainstorm or it was a deliberate act of arson. We are yet to get that. Um, it's a lesson mm. but the prison culture the world over, arms are accepted in prison to a certain level. Mm at Sentry Post and at the Armory. Mm -hmm. If we had proper structured prisons, mm. this would not happen. Mm. You don't need arms to reform or correct somebody. Mm. That's the mentality of prisoners. Mm. I mean, prisons the world over. Mm -hmm. So if we get properly structured prisons, mm. we still don't need arms inside the prisons. It's a danger to have arms within a prison that is so tight. So a in prison that case, is supposed mm. to hold uh, 416 inmates okay. is holding 200, 2,000 plus inmates. Okay. I mean, you can imagine they're just milling where will you hoist your weapon? If mm. somebody picks it by force, the one who died, that was what we saw. He tried seizing a weapon from the police mm -hmm. officer, mm -hmm. and then there was a trigger. Mm. And that was what happened. So it is not always the best to hold weapons inside the prison, but mm. outside, sentry, and the armory. If you have a properly structured prison, that is the best way to go. Mm. So we need more reinforcement, and that's why we're calling the police. That's why, that's why you, called, you called in the police yes. indeed. So go, go in, what, what happens now, going forward? Well, as we speak now, investigations are underway. The director general is there. The regional security members are all on ground. Mm. They'll find out the root cause. Mm. As I said, we don't know whether the fire was started by somebody mm. or by the lightning, as we are told. Mm. But if they were leaders to this, they would be taken out of Kumasi Central Prison and transferred to a much probably safer place mm -hmm. or a place that they don't have the influence they are having today, if there was any at all. Thanks for your company here yeah, still. Now, uh, the Ghana Revenue Authority is embarking on a distress action aimed at collecting unpaid taxes from defaulting companies. The Ghana Revenue Authority is expected to visit four companies today here in the Greater Accra region. That's what I'm saying with the Ghana Revenue Authority crew, and she's joining me over the telephone with fresh details. Hello, Etonam. Hello, Etonam. I think the line dropped, and we'll put an effort to raise it when I'm over the telephone again and bring, the, bring back this conversation. Now, you recall that the Ghana Revenue Authority missed its 2014 target of 17.61 billion Ghana cities and made 17.07 billion Ghana cities, although it was a significant increase from the 2013 uh, target of 13. 
1.6 billion Ghana cities. We can now find out what's happening with the GRA crew on this distress action. Etonam says, join me over the telephone. Hello, Etonam. Hello, Termini. What can you report? All right. Um, we visited the first construction firm, uh, which is uh, K. Opori Enterprise Limited. Uh, the construction, a very big construction firm with over 2,000 people. And um, apparently, they have been, uh, they have not been paying tax for a year now. Uh, what happens is that instead of issuing the approved uh, 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 VAT invoice, they have printed their own VAT invoice, which they issue to uh, uh, customers. And so when you come, they charge you VAT, but it doesn't go to government, it goes to their coffers. And so uh, the, uh, the Ghana Revenue Authority with assistance from the Ghana police, and some police personnel, they detected some arrests. So some people have been arrested. And so we are moving to the next uh, next point, which uh, we are told is around Pukwasi. And so that's, that's currently what the situation is, Kennedy. But what was the reception there for the Ghana Revenue Authority staff? What, um, uh, come again, Kemini. How did the company receive the Ghana Revenue Authority staff? Of course, they were hesitant. You know, they are main, of, uh, companies like this, you don't have the owner of the company at post. You have other people he delegated to work in his stead. And so we, we met other men who like managers of the company who were not the owners of the company. So they wanted to call their bosses and, of course, they uh, tried to buy some time, but the police will not have them. Uh, they want to, they've been arrested. Hello, Tanam. Yes, they've been arrested that way. Uh, they will be able to get hold of the owner of the company. And so uh, it, was, it wasn't for the, for the, uh, for the Ghana Revenue Authority, but for the assistance of the police, uh, it's at, we were able to arrested the men behind them. I see. Did the Revenue Authority indicate how they were able to fish out these companies that were not paying? Yes. What, what they said was that earlier, before we embarked on this journey, they said they had to send people to come and buy from them. They were hated by customers. You know, so they sent people to come and buy from them. And when they bought from them, they were not issued an invoice. They approved invoice. Rather, they were issued the invoice for the company. They printed their own invoice and they're issuing it to customers. And so whatever they are charging you is coming to them. They are not paying anything. And so what happened was that they, they sent people several times, not more than what. Are, more are more. they now able to tell how much this company, for instance, uh, uh, has not paid in taxes? Yes, they have collected the, their own tax invoice. Uh, the, so the last one that they, they printed themselves, they have collected all of them, they, what all the things they have documented, they have collected all of them, so they are not going to use the calculation to know how much they pay their own taxes. What's the next stop from Dawenya? I told them. Yes, Kemini. I'm asking what the next stop, where the next stop is. Yes, um, we are on our way to Pokwasi right now. We are told another company, so like I told you earlier, mm. we are going to Dawenya. We, we just left Dawenya. We are well. going to Pokwasi. We are going to Agroba and then Aoshi. So our next stop right now is Pokwasi. Very well. Th thank you very much for uh, that report. Uh, Tanam Say joined us from Dawenya. Let's go back briefly on the issue of the attempted jailbreak in Kumasi. What we understand now, or happening now, is that the prisoners uh, are being transferred to some other prisons. And we've learned already that they are being transferred to the Anka for prison. Erastus, Erastus Asari Donko is a correspondent in the Ashanti region. He's joined me over the telephone with some detail. Hello, Erastus. The line dropped on us. Uh, we'll fix that problem and get Erastus back over uh, the telephone. But you recall that earlier, uh, Mark Woyungo had told us that had told us uh, that some security was going to be provided to be able to transfer uh, these uh, inmates to the anchor for prisons. And and I'm talking about the interior. Minister Mark Woyongo. But Erastus Asari Donko is back over the telephone line. Let's find out the reality on the ground as far as this transfer is concerned. Hello, Erastus. Yeah, I can hear you now. Uh, we understand that these uh, prisoners are being transferred 
in uh, MMT, MMT buses. Uh, what can you report on this? Well, uh, it's correct. Uh, we do have one transfer vehicle uh, fitted with this uh, wire mesh uh, uh, standing by. Currently, that one has been loaded uh, now. Uh, 28 inmates so far in Hancock have been uh, transferred into that vehicle as we speak. Um, uh, three Metro Mass Transit buses have also uh, parked in front of the prison, uh, uh, central prison, and I do understand that more inmates will be parked into uh, those ones as well before they start their journey. The destination officials will not tell us. Um, our checks indicate uh, they will be distributed evenly across the regions. So in someone is going to get a fair share, and we're going to have others being transported to other regions as well. So currently the uh, transfer is going on uh, 28 inmates so far um, in Hancock. Some of them mm. uh, are partially dressed in boxes alone. Some of them also in uh, the prison blue attire. Uh, they, they look unkempt, mm. some of them very dirty. And uh, some of them are also walking majestically as they uh, enter uh, that particular vehicle as well. How secure would you say this transfer is? Uh, come again. I'm asking how secure, from your observation, would you say this transfer is? The line is very bad. Uh, uh, let's give it another try. I'm asking how secure you think this transfer is. Well, uh, for now, I will not be able to judge, but um, unless probably they finish and we see the escort, the type of escort uh, that will follow uh, these, these buses. Because for now, uh, we have a number of armed police uh, personnel uh, standing by. We have a number of armed military officers also standing by. Uh, I'm made to understand that the police patrol vehicle, a number of them will accompany uh, this uh, transfer. A number of uh, mil uh, uh, prison vehicles have also been parked here. I do understand that armed men uh, will board these vehicles and they will also be uh, uh, sort of uh, going mm. with this particular transfer. So. If you judge by that, then you will say that it is secure. What do you know about the numbers being transferred? The numbers have not been disclosed, but if I do a rough calculation, currently we have 28 inmates, as I counted, boarding the prison's transfer vehicle. Um, three MMT buses, so if you do the calculation roughly, uh, if one of these buses could pick 200, then we are talking about uh, 600 more uh, to fit in this vehicle. Uh, so roughly we'll be having around uh, 630. Erasmus, thank you very much for the report. Erasmus Donko joined us from the Ashanti region where some inmates of the Kumasi Central Prison are being transferred to various pre prisons across the country following last night's attempted jailbreak. Now, we'll bring you more on that in subsequent broadcasts. But to come here on Joy News today, Kualkas's case in court has been adjourned to 13th of February for definite here. And you recall that he has been in the grips of the police for a smoking substance believed to be marijuana in public glare. Uh, don't go away. I'll bring you details of that story and, pl that story and plenty others in a bit. This is joining you today now. Hip life artist Emmanuel Bucci, you may know him as Carl Kessie, returned to court today on a charge of smoking substance believed to be uh, marijuana. And uh, my, my colleague Mohammed Nuruddin has joined me over the telephone with some detail of the hearing today. Hello, Nuruddin. Hello, Kamini. Uh, tell us what happened in court. Uh, Kamini, Carl uh, Kessie was in court, his lawyer was in court, and the state prosecutor was also in court. but. Uh, all, all, both the lawyer for Kwakesi and then uh, the state prosecutor were not ready to carry on with the case today. And so they have agreed to uh, continue with the case on February 13th. Uh, we, uh, the information was that uh, on the 13th, there would, uh, the, the, the would I mean, uh, 
begin with a substantive issue, uh, then the, the, the trial will begin on 30th. And the state procedure was telling me that they would present their witnesses on that very day, three witnesses. I am told uh, one, uh, two of them are policemen and one is an investigator. And uh, if uh, there is the need for them to tender in their evidences, mm. they will do that on that very day. So uh, that very day, uh, the, he, he also said that very day too, there wouldn't be any excuses because they, they, it's going to be the definite hearing on the 13th. Very I mean, well. Now, what reason was given for the inability of both parties to the case to present uh, their matter in court today? Well, uh, the, you know the case hasn't started yet. Uh, in, the previous, uh, in the previous days that they went to court, uh, it was about the, the, the condition of Paul Casey, mm. which his lawyers were pleading the court to grant him bail. And that was, I mean, exactly what the court did. And now uh, the, the court has to begin with the case. And so today, for instance, uh, if, if, if the, the state prosecutor tells me that even if they were going to uh, continue with the case, uh, um, they wouldn't be able to provide the witnesses today. But though they have them, but uh, they were not prepared to carry on with the case today. So both of them agreed to appear well. on the 13th. Thank you very much, Nuruddin, for the updates. Mohamed Nuruddin joined us from the Ashanti region. But now, it's time for Sports Baba Tando is here. She'll join me briefly. Hello. Hi. It's, it's good to see you again. What are we expecting? I know we ha we'll have something on the Black Stars. <laughs> definitely, definitely. Too many things on the Black Stars. I mean, my bulletin will be Black Stars by yes this afternoon. This afternoon. So a lot more, a lot more sure, analysis sure, sure. on what we should expect. The GSP president is talking. Mm. Um, Ghana's new sensation, the ladies' man now, Kisiapia, has also been speaking. Mm. Uh, Judge Afia, the uh, uh, management committee chairman of the Black Stars, is also talking. I mean... But he, no, cannot, he cannot forget what happened to Agogo. Oh. I'll, I'll, let you have, I'll let you have the, the studio now. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. Course. And uh, like I was saying to Kemini, um, a lot of people have been talking ahead of this uh, match, this crucial semi-final uh, match with Equatorial Guinea. And let's first take a listen to striker Kusi Apia, who's been speaking to our cameras. Well, obviously, every team has their own experienced players and... Um, we obviously have many of those, and we also have some young players that are also equally as hungry to, to do well for, for Ghana. So um, we will draw on that, and hopefully that can give us an edge in the game. To be quite honest with you, I mean, the football laws are, are outlined by, you know, the officials and stuff like that. So we're not too fussed about any referee and, you know, decisions or anything like that. We're to play a game, and, and everybody has to deal with the situations out on the pitch. So we'll, we'll see what happens on the day. Yeah, obviously they've been um, instrumental in me settling into the group. Um, from, from day one, obviously, they welcomed me in, and, and until now, they've all been great with me, so I'm very grateful for them. It's not quite as detailed as that, but, I mean, they're all very nice and, and, and warm, warm guys, so they obviously all helped me yeah, ease into the group, and, and they've been great with me, so I'm thankful for that. But, well, obviously, you know, there's, there's codes of conduct that you need to, to stay tuned to, and obviously they help you stay on, on track. We have a lot of leaders within the group. Um, Obviously, he's, he's an experienced player, and, and he adds to that. So um, I can't go into too much detail about his his, his day to day duties, but he's, he's a cool guy, and, and he adds to the to the leadership roles that we have. Yeah, obviously, I mean, all my family back home in, in in Ghana and in England are watching in on the games, and obviously they're sending me loads of messages and stuff like that. We're talking regularly about how things are going, and they're obviously very pleased and, and very proud of of what's, what's been achieved so far. Um, and into the dancing, you know, I'm picking up new moves uh, as the days go by, so um, hopefully we'll see some more in the, in the future. <laughs> to be quite honest with you, you know, the goal in every game is to win, and that will be the, the, the mindset from the offset. Yeah, I mean, obviously he has clear ideas that he wants to project into the team, and as time goes by, obviously we'll take to that and, and produce that on the pitch, and I think you can see uh, in, in our most recent results how we've progressed under him. So, um, yeah, he's, he's got some clear ideas that we're buying into. Right, so news just in. This is a probable starting 11 from Coach Abram Grant. A probable starting 11, though. Uh, we have Jordan Ayu, Jordan Ayu replacing injured as Samwa Jan. And uh, also John Boy is starting ahead of the fully recovered Daniel Amati. So this is how it's going to look like, probably. Goalkeeper will have Razak Braima. Uh, Harrison Afo, Baba Rahman, Jonathan Mensah, John Boy, they will man the defense. Mubarak Kwakasu, Refiye Akwa, Christian Achu, Andre Dede Ayu will man the midfield. And then Jordan Ayu, Kwesiafia, they will be uh, striking for the Black Stars. 
probably. All right, so um, away from that, uh, but still on this particular game, president of the Ghana Football Association, Kosi Nyante, he says that it is his belief that indeed the Black Stars will not only beat Equatorial Guinea to qualify for the finals, but indeed we can also win the trophy. I see it's not as a challenge to me as a person, but to the Football Association. I have raised this issue many times in many fora, uh, expressing the view that that could be our inability to go beyond the semi-final on those previous occasions might be a psychological shortcoming. And so I tax the experts in that area to look at how we can unravel the mystery surrounding it. But I believe that uh, if Ghana went beyond the semi-finals into the finals, it will make all of us happy, and uh, especially those of us at the helm of affairs will be happier. All Ghanaians will be happy, and uh, as Ghanaians, we will all be happy. But those of us closely associated with the team will be happier because it would have been uh, a demonstration of uh, an outcome, a favorable outcome from all the investment, all the sacrifice and all the hard work that we have put into this team. Uh, football is always the results that shows. You can do anything and everything. If you don't get the results, it means you haven't done much. And all these years that we spent at the Federation will be seen not, as, uh, not with the achievements that we, we expect until we, we have something concrete to show. So as a football association and as a person, I think it will be very good. I will be happy. And uh, it will encourage me as a person in other aspects or other spheres of my life. Hi, news just in uh, says Ghana will buy 80 megawatts of power from neighboring Ivory Coast to ensure Ghanaians can watch the national soccer team's match against Equatorial Guinea later today, according to the country's main power supplier, uh, the Volta River Authority. Now, Ghana and Ivory Coast have arrangements to buy each other's excess supply. And Kofi Ellis, Director of Business Development and Sales at the VRA, set by phone in Accra today. Now, Ghana faces host Equatorial Guinea in the second semi-final of the Africa Cup of Nations ongoing. Uh, the winner will play Ivory Coast in the final on February 8th. Now, still on this game, I'm sure you're one of um, the many Ghanaian football enthusiasts who will credit our head coach, Abram Grant, for the successes the Black Stars are chalking in Equatorial Guinea. One of such people happens to be FA President Kusin Yantichi. He is showing a lot of praise on coach Abram Grant. He's discharged himself creditably. Um, we knew very well as humans, we knew that it might look impossible to expect him to overturn the fortunes of the team within a short time because uh, he will need to do some work. That's why our target was a bit ambivalent when we said go and do well. Uh, failure to win a trophy could not be grounds for his dismissal. But I agree with you that the results have been positively dramatic. <laughs> uh, a sudden turnaround looking good, looking towards a final and looking towards winning the trophy. I cannot wait to, to, to see uh, Ghana progressing beyond the semi-finals. But I think we have to also give a lot of credit to Abraham Grant. He's done very well. I know the impact he has made on this team. He's made a huge impact. And that is contributing immensely to the results we are achieving. So join me at 2 p.m. on this channel for Soccer Rocks. Uh, today, there will be a lot of behind-the-scenes stuff for you, so you don't want to miss Soccer Rocks at 2 p.m. But for now, my job is done. Good afternoon. Thanks for your company. Now, the 2016 flag bearer of the main opposition, New Patriotic Party, Nana Dudanko Akufuadu, has parried perceptions that the party's property-owning democracy philosophy is driven by the love of luxury. 
He was speaking at the commemoration of the 50th anniversary of the deaths of the founder and member of the NPP's forebear political tradition, Dankwa Buzia Dumbo. Here are excerpts of the lecture. Dankwa's vision was to build in Ghana a society where every Ghanaian was empowered with access to education, skills, and job opportunities to contribute fully to nation building and self enhancement This is why the policy of the NTP government from 2001 to 2009 was to clear the ground for the purpose of inviting every Ghanaian to climb the ladder of competitive achievement. We know that without many players, markets fail to deliver quality at the best price. And without everybody on board, our democratic ship risks sinking under its own tilted weight. This thinking is very much against what is being exhibited currently in Ghana, which permits a small class to have a near monopoly of the wealth of the country. A similar state of affairs in his day made Duncan declare in 1950 in the Legislative Council about the colonial government. And I quote, what we want is a government in touch with the very life of their people, the sorrows, their groans, their wants, their sufferings, and their grievances. Until we get that government, this country will forever continue to agitate and demand for a better government. Then we abhor the misuse of public money under any circumstance. In his day, his typewriter was always handy to write letters to those in authority and beyond to see that some wrong was righted. He argued passionately that public money ought to be managed by people who were committed to the country's interests. He declared in the Legislative Assembly one day, and I quote, if you are going to entrust public money to persons who are not going to be honest, and who are going to yield to bribery and corruption, and who are going to allow themselves to be influenced, then you are not doing good to the country, unquote. I wonder what he would have made of what Our top story is here on News Today. Evacuation at the Kumasi Central Prison begins as the Interior Minister promises to redistribute the prisoners to other prisons across the country. Electricity Company of Ghana out with new load shedding timetable. Caucasus case adjourned to February 13 for definite hearing. Find more news on myjawonline.com. Thank you very much for your company here. My name is Kimini Nyamani Amana. Have a good afternoon.